Oh, welcome back to Sunday Science, everybody. Thanks for joining us. On, uh, hopefully, for everybody out there, a beautiful day as it has been for me. Uh, <laughs> you can never tell what weather's like elsewhere, so I can only hope. Uh, so, today we're going to be talking about a little project that SciStrike and I and other members of our panel that were not able to make it today are very in, have seemed very interested in sitting down and producing. So SciStrike originally actually found this project in what sounds like a, an old ham radio operator uh, magazine, if I'm correct. Indeed. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and it is effectively a do-it-yourself, build-at-home amateur radio telescope. So in the past, obviously, we've discussed a large amount about observatories and how all of that fun stuff works. I don't think we need to backtrack on that too much, and I don't have a whole lot of imagery to share in that realm. So it might just be a little bit more talk and a little less picture. But obviously, radio being part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum, you have an absolutely wonderful detailed way of viewing the cosmos in light that we are unable to see, but we are able to still sit down and take into account and look at everything around us in a different light, if you will. Oh, I see, <laughs> I see what you did there. A different light. Nicely done. <laughs> anyway, well, I, I have... you know, <laughs> we talked about the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and we've, we've talked about a lot of visible and infrared, near infrared, a whole lot of things, but we never really got into a whole lot of the radio end. So I think this is going to be a really fun project to actually sit down and take a look at building one of these. I've considered it in the past and my, my knowledge of radio communications is limited by comparison to side strikes. So I was pretty excited when he, put this one on the table and suggested it it's i think it's going to be a lot of fun to build and it it kind of looks like you've actually already getting in gotten into building uh some of some components that would get you that one extra step closer with the uh antenna array that you showed me earlier uh you want to go ahead and fill everybody in on that one and let them know what that's about si oh all right uh well, the um, I, I, I'm not sure the I think the antenna that I sent you a picture of that one is for our uh, gearing up for for attempting a uh, voice uh, contact with the the uh, ham radio station on the ISS. That that's, that's exactly the one I was thinking yes, of, and I, th I thought that would be a good place to start, just because it it does a little bit more of a ham radio operation. I have a I have an introductory book, but I haven't actually gotten too far into it, so I'm very excited to learn some more about this. Okay, well, um, there's uh, there's always been a ham station on the ISS, and whenever the uh, whenever the uh, the crew stationed is is not otherwise occupied, which is not all that often. If you happen to if, if you happen to uh, call on uh, on frequency when you're in their radio footprint. Uh, invariably you will get a response and you get to log a contact with uh, space, which is kind of cool. And um, that antenna was needed because, <laughs> look, at, look at Bo in the public chat. Is it a 100 element quad beam? No, no, it's not. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just a, it's a dual band. Um, uh, it's called an egg beater antenna uh, for the reason is that the reason is because each element looks each set of elements looks like an egg beater. Um, and in this particular antenna, it's made for ham satellite use. Um, all, uh, all the ham satellites that, and yes, ham operators have organized themselves and have actually put satellites uh, into orbit. Uh, usually it's a secondary payload 
on the launch, either NASA launch or any other space agency willing to uh, to help them out. And it seems they, they do with great frequency. Let's see what I did there, frequency. Anyway, mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the ham satellites uh, usually operate uh, the uplink where you send a signal to it and the downlink where it, it uh, repeats it back down on two different bands so that you can transmit and receive at the same time. So you can hear your own signal or if someone else is calling at the same time, you can, uh, you know, wait, wait for them to finish. Um, uh, unlike movie night. Um, <laughs> however, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, um, the ISS, uh, the the voice uplink and downlink downlink are both on the on the two meter band, um, right in the uh, coincidentally, <laughs> right in the ham two meter band. Um, so I, I'm only going to be using uh, one half of this dual band antenna to try to accomplish uh, uh, the ISS contact on a future Sunday Science show. Um, but yes, and that was uh, we we're well on the way. Uh, to getting that working the let's see you know the antennas up the uh, the radio which is a uh, uh, radio built by yesu that was actually designed for uh, satellite work because not not many transceivers are designed to be able to transmit and receive at the same time um, so that uh, that is that is going to be a lot of fun and not not just because we're uh, we're going to be you know broadcasting it live and all that sort of thing it's Damn exciting to be able to <laughs> squeeze the microphone and have an astronaut talk back to you. That's, <laughs> that's, so, that's, that's it's not an everyday thing. <laughs> so. No, it, it, it's really not. It's it's a really cool venture, and it I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to seeing how that all comes together and is actually deployed, and that's just really cool. <laughs> Indeed. Oh yeah, Bo, Bo is correct. You can uh, the uh, a lot of the handsets <coughs> that 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 have been put up uh, just with a handheld radio. You can get. And actually, the ISS has a has a damn good uh, uh, two meter antenna on it with a handheld. You can you can usually hit that as well. It's not as easy, and it helps if you have a beam antenna or something of that sort. But uh, it's with uh, in uh, VHF, which is the uh, two meters in VHF uh, going straight to an unobstructed efficient receiving and transmitting antenna they, they do make it easy for you so anyway we'll be trying that coming up on a future show uh we just have to uh time it so that uh the uh you know the pass when when it when it goes overhead we're in the we're in its uh, radio footprint at the at this time, at the time when we're doing this show, that that's not that hard to calculate. So, right, and I mean, if if we need to adjust the show time by a little bit here or there in order to make it happen, I think it's worth it. But but Andy, we've never moved the show off of five o'clock on a Sunday, have we? No, <laughs> no, that's never happened. <laughs> same on. time, same place, every night for months. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, Tuesday sort of sounds like Sunday. All right, yeah, we'll get a pass for it. It ends in Y. It, there it's you still go. A. All right. Anyway, so that's coming up, and uh, we'll uh, and we'll, we'll we'll certainly give that a shot. There's no guarantee we'll be successful. Um, as we want one, every everybody with the ability to do so does try to do it. So there may be uh, there may be other stations. We may not have. Uh, as much luck as we'd like, but we're going to give it a shot, which will be kind of cool. Sometimes that's all you can do is just give it a shot. Indeed. And, and if not, (laughs) we'll just hit a couple of the ham sets. (laughs) Right. (laughs) No problems there. (laughs) Indeed. But, uh, yeah, that, uh, I, I think that that should be a lot of fun and maybe folks, absolutely. Maybe folks who've never heard of, uh, uh, you know, the whole amateur radio thing will actually, you know, get interested in it. A, lo- a lot of people that have heard of it will say something like, yeah, that's uh oh yeah, yeah, ham radio. My, my grandfather or my father used to do that. Like it's, like it's a thing of the past, not, not aware that there's ongoing development, like spacecraft oh, <laughs> that hams are doing. <laughs> not only ongoing development, there's 
I mean, there's entire organizations that do, you know, the uh, hunts across the United States where you you have to be a ham operator so that you can even sit down and go on the little hunt. And quite true. My uh, my former uh, pilot instructor that I never actually finished my pilot's license. That was stupid. I should have. But I never actually finished it, but the PIC that I was working with and doing ground school with, he was a big-time ham operator and always had to schedule what time he was actually going to be in town because he was going all over the place on these you know, scavenger hunts for ham radio operators. And it's actually how I wound up getting my first operator book was working with him. But unfortunately, due to age and other ailments, he was grounded and instead of taking his suggestion and going with one of his other students to finish out my license, I just kind of gave up. Hmm. Fortunately, there's still time left uh, for you. If you ever, <laughs> if it ever catches your interest again, because I know you're just overflowing with free time. Oh yeah. I just <laughs> sit around not knowing what to do all day, every day. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Anyway, um, uh. I have a couple of, sh- a couple of shorts just to, a couple of short short videos just uh, on radio astronomy and, and, and how it works and that sort of thing. Just just to oh, very awesome. So I why don't I throw one of those up here? here yeah, we, let's take a look. Here's uh, radio astronomy in five minutes. Here we go. Let's see what we got. When you tell people that you're a radio astronomer, they often have no idea what you mean. They know what a radio is, um, but maybe they get astronomy confused with astrology, and they come to the conclusion that you deliver horoscopes over the radio. This is not, in fact, what radio astronomers do. Radio astronomers use telescopes like this, or arrays of radio telescopes like this. They point it at the sky, and they collect light, which is in a very specific part of the electromagnetic spectrum. This part, this part right at the end here with the long wavelengths. For reference, you see that little narrow strip of visible light? That's what your eye is capable of seeing. But to look elsewhere, so to look in the radio, for example, you need to use telescopes. So we take our radio telescopes, we point them to the night sky, and we see this. This is what the sky looks like in the radio. Now you might look at this and think, oh, oh yeah, I see. This is basically what the sky looks like normally, right? All the little dots are stars. And I'll stop you, and I'll say, no, you're wrong. Every single one of those dots is a radio galaxy. None of those are stars. Those blotches to the left are supernova remnants, and those big whiter blotches up here are clouds of ionized gas. So I've already made one of my points, that looking in the radio opens a window to an otherwise invisible universe. Another example. This is an optical image of the M81 group, a group of galaxies in the Big Dipper. This is the same image in the radio. You get more information. The radio image tells you more than just where the stars are. It tells you where the neutral atomic hydrogen gas is, which is correlated to where the stars are, but which shows you that the galaxies are actually interacting with each other, which is a fact that you totally miss in the optical. Another example, this is an optical image of Centaurus A, a sort of ordinary looking elliptical galaxy. When you look in the radio, you see that there is this feature that's totally invisible in the optical. This galaxy has huge radio lobes that are being emitted from the supermassive black hole at its center. That's awesome. Each of those little dots that I showed you in that uh, picture of the radio sky is one of these radio galaxies. This is another radio image. Uh, You might have seen it before. It's the microwave cosmic background radiation, which is radiation that was emitted right after the Big Bang in its aftermath when things were beginning to cool down. It's in the radio because as the universe expanded, so did that radiation. So the radiation went to longer and longer wavelengths, and longer wavelengths is in the radio end of the spectrum. Being able to see this has totally revolutionized cosmology. Um, It's enabled cosmologists to learn more about the early universe, learn about how the universe has evolved, learn about dark matter, and it's in the radio. So radio is the best. Another reason to observe in the radio, Earth's atmosphere actually absorbs most of the radiation coming from space. Um, most of the electromagnetic spectrum. So you see here, those lines that are so up at the top, that means full absorption. That light doesn't get to us at all. There are only two windows. One is in the visible, 
that very narrow window there, and one is in the radio, that huge window over here. Bigger window means bigger range of wavelengths, means bigger range of sources. Third, there's a technique um, that's unique to radio astronomy called interferometry, which allows us to get very high resolution of what we're looking at. Basically, you take a bunch of different tel uh, tel telescopes, um, 27 telescopes in this case, you put them in one array, you point them all at the same object, so, so you're looking at that object from a bunch of different angles, and you combine that information, all those different perspectives, to make one high-resolution image. You could even put those telescopes across the whole North American continent, put one in Hawaii, put one in the Virgin Islands, and get what is called the Very Long Baseline Array, which has the resolution ability to read a newspaper in Los Angeles from New York. So a quick recap of why radio astronomy is awesome. It gives you access to this otherwise invisible universe. It enables you to perform ground-based observing, which is a lot cheaper and more convenient for astronomers. And it allows you to get ridiculously high resolution on things like the structure of galaxies using the technique called interferometry. Basically, radio astronomy is a lot more than this. Okay. Well, there we go. Very nice. Now, I will, uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a spoiler, but uh, might as well. The um, uh, the radio telescope we're going to be, amateur radio telescope that we're going to be working on uh, building, that any of you that want to build along with us, by all means. Um, Absolutely. And, the more the yeah. merrier, especially, especially in radio astronomy. Absolutely. And then we could all link them together and do interference. Yeah, I have trouble with that. All right. Uh, interferometry. <laughs> in interferometry. There we go. I think I got it. Anyway, uh, the uh, uh, the dish we're going to be using is uh, you know to keep the keep the price where it ought to be for this kind of project is uh, one of the standard satellite TV dishes you see all over the place, bolted to houses and poles and whatnot. And um, I believe th those are those are X band, which is you know eight eight to twelve gigahertz, something like that. Which puts them in uh, the bands are specified in wavelength. How long each 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 wave is, and this uh, the X band is like three, uh, just under under uh, four centimeters down to two and a half centimeters. Now, if we go back in this video, hopefully I can find it. Oh, look at that! First try. <laughs> Perfect. What we find is that this puts it in a, in a range that is not that that passes through the atmosphere fairly well, almost as if the folks transmitting satellite TV uh, wanted it to be able to pierce the atmosphere, almost. But <laughs> it's almost it's almost like they knew they had to go and put a satellite into orbit around a globe. And sorry, wrong wrong day. It, yeah, indeed. <laughs> and almost as if they knew the signal had to reach the ground without uh, distortion, blockage, or or uh, or refraction. Anyway, oh, can you imagine what they would have done if they didn't know any of this stuff and ran at a hundred micron wavelength? Uh, <laughs> it would, uh, yeah. So that's this should be a, a fairly effective receiver, um, and it means we don't have to round up one of those uh, old style eight foot satellite remember the old eight foot satellite dishes oh yeah <laughs> we don't have to go <laughs> digging around for one of those anyway oh no those those direct tv ones and you know what they're all over the place yeah and and the higher the higher the frequency the the uh, uh shorter the wavelength of course so a smaller dish will have the same uh focusing and amplifying effect as a larger dish would at a lower frequency so uh Anyway, uh, all right, I have one more here. It's a, a very uh, high level, like like almost U2 spy plane level um, overview of how a radio telescope works. So this is, awesome. uh, here's, here's that. It's a quickie. Our radio telescopes that we use for SETI the observing systems that we, that we use at radio telescopes are not dissimilar from this radio. Now, if I turned on this radio, all you would hear is, is static at most places on the radio dial. 
but at certain places on the radio dial there's there's music or there's talk radio there's a there's a signal there and uh, a signal from an extraterrestrial technology would look very much the same it would have extra energy or some kind of a signal at only one channel at only one channel on the radio dial luckily we don't have to tune a dial uh, with our with our instruments our instruments can actually monitor billions of different radio frequencies all at the same time instantaneously so if we see any any radio station if we see a, a signal that pops up against the static then we know that there's there's something interesting there something sort of contemporary There you go. That that's a that that's a quickie. <laughs> so. Definitely was a quickie, but still a good one. And it it kind of brings to mind some of the things that you know. There's there's a there's a lot of things with uh, cloud based usage of computers that I'm not too fond of. And then there's other things like potentially doing collaborations with a multitude of people that. Mm, you could actually have a significant computing power at your fingertips with an amateur array of this type. Quite true. Quite true. And uh, alrighty. Uh, okay. Well, on, on to the project, I guess. Now, um, we've already mentioned this is not a uh, an Andy or a Sai invention. That <laughs> this particular project, but um, we're looking at this as a starting point. So first one, and by the way, the the um, I put a link in the description of this video for the PDF from QST Magazine. That's building the whole thing start to finish. If anybody wants to just jump ahead and look at that, feel free to, you know, do that. But um, anyway, let's see. Let me get an image up here. All right, there we go. Here's here's uh, here's basically what the uh, what the finished product of the one that's described in the PDF looks like. It's it's basically a slightly modified uh, uh, TV dish antenna. Now the modification they're talking about has nothing to do with changing the focal length or anything anything of that sort. It's just a standard um, you know off center uh, fed dish. No, no. The only thing that the uh, that the article tells you how to change is taking the LNB, which is a low noise block, and because at the time it was written, um, one satellite dish would have two or even three of these LNBs, and you only want one for this. So it covers uh, cutting it, and making a making a uh, custom mount to hold just one in the proper positions. If you're lucky, you can come across a dish that only has one, and then you're set. Um, and yeah, yes, Bo, it's upside down. <laughs> That's just... Mount, mounting is easier that way. Anyway, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> e e either a modified TV dish antenna, if it's with multiple LNBs, or, or unmodified if it's a standard one. Um, what's There's kind of a cheat here. We, there's a... Uh, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen the uh, signal strength meters you use. If you're if you were to point your own dish at the satellite, you use this to see when you get the strongest signal. Um, those are very inexpensive. I've seen them on the internet for uh, uh, oh I don't know ten bucks, um, and they pull voltages out of that to give you the uh, the signal strength. Uh, there is some building and soldering that's going to be involved. You have to make an interface that takes this signal strength and uh, converts it into a, a tone that'll change with the strength of the signal. And then um, finally, that 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 tone is basically fed into the sound card on your computer. And um, there's there's actually some freeware that you can use uh, that'll graph it for you. It'll take that tone and graph it over time. Um, to to show your uh, you know what you are receiving. Uh, that's called Skypipe, and I'll put a link in the description for that as well. Um, yeah, it's it's not a it, it's definitely not a very complicated uh, circuit. Anyway, let's see what else about this do I need to mention? Uh, oh yeah, just with 
just with the project as it stands in the PDF with no modifications. You do what it says. What can you do with this thing? Um, obviously, you know, what's, <laughs> what's the, the closest and biggest radio transmitter uh, near our Earth is the sun. Um, you can uh, measure the radiation intensity of the sun and uh, even notice changes in time as, as the solar activity is always changing. Um, you can do other things that you might not think about, like measure the, the uh, relative changes in the surface temperature of the moon, for example. Nobody thinks about that. Um, RF is emitted, um, and certainly in this band, by the moon. Um, let's see. Um, what other interesting things? Oh, <laughs> if, you, if you're bored, you can detect satellites parked along the Clark Belt. That's a handy thing. And, uh, and, and all like that. All right. Uh, let us go through a few of the other images here just to give you an idea what we're going to be building. You know, it's, it's kind of a shame. A few years ago, I was doing some, you know, renovating and cleaning up around the house. Mm -hmm. And I have a maple tree on the west side of the house, and it was starting to knock into the old dish receiver that the prior owners had. So I'm finally going to get up there and tear it down. I don't want the branches of the maple getting between the dish and the roof, wrecking mm -hmm. shingles, causing problems. And I held on to it for about a year going, I'm going to, at some point in time, I will do an amateur radio telescope. And then I dropped a kayak on it and I broke it and I threw it in the dumpster. And now I'm going, I should have put that in the garage. Mm -hmm. Why did I leave it outside? <laughs> Yeah, you're not the only one. I've, I've, uh, yeah. Actually, I've, I've tossed a couple just because they had nothing to do with these things. I, it didn't. I was really too busy to go into any projects with them. After there were enough other projects going on. And oh yeah. <laughs> let's see here, what do we got? Um, oh right, yeah. Uh, this is an example of, of one of the uh, one of the dual uh, LNBs uh, that you would have to modify so it's just holding one. Uh, like I said, if you're lucky and you can find one of the old ones that just has one LNB, that's, you know, you're, you're, you're one step ahead of the game. Um, yeah, essentially it's, you know, this is, th this shows the, the modification so that you only have one. Um, now, the part that'll probably scare some folks off, and I'll tell you, do not be, because it's not as complicated as it looks, is... Um, Here's a, here's a block diagram of uh, of the circuit that goes between uh, the your your antenna or dish and the meter and your computer sound card. And this is the actual circuit. I told you it's it's scary looking, but it really isn't. No, <laughs> that's actually not scary looking whatsoever. It is well. Well, for, for, for people that are a little hesitant with the soldering iron, it might be. Um, uh, well, okay, I could understand where it might be a little bit intimidating, but this actually looks surprisingly similar to one of the oh, uh, one of the PID control heating mechanisms that was I had to build for my dye sublimation press. Mm -hmm. it, actually, not really not a whole lot different, but indeed, and and um. Like I said, it, this is going to be an, an ongoing project to go through this, and uh, you know we'll do it together if anyone needs any assistance. And there was Andy and I were even talking about uh, it might not be a bad idea to look up um, uh, places that'll that'll etch uh, printed circuit boards for us that we could, you know, have uh, have ten or twenty of them made. And if you know if someone wants to build this, but doesn't feel like doing point to point wiring, we'll give them that. <laughs> And that'll right. that'll make it a little easier for them, but uh, anyway, it's not a complicated circuit. And as like we mentioned, we're we're always here. You can get to us on Discord. Uh, happy to uh, offer any assistance we can. Absolutely. Anyway, using the 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 free software that I mentioned and is in the PDF. If you download it, you end up with uh, graphs that look sort of like this. And this will be, um, it, it's really enough. It's enough that you can demonstrate that 
you know what you're uh, what you're expecting to happen is happening. Like if you have a stationary, you have the antenna pointed uh, in 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 one direction. As the sun goes by, you'll notice the increase and decrease and the received signal and all that sort of thing. Um, so just as itself, this project is actually pretty useful, um, and you know definitely something interesting to show off. Hey, look, I have a radio telescope in my backyard. Um, right. <laughs> <That's> however, <laughs> however <laughs> I, I, I believe everybody listening kind of knows us, Andy. So they're well aware that we're not happy with that. <laughs> oh no, there needs to be more, especially if right. <clears throat> one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the projects I've been working on since I built the, you know, six inch, refract the six inch refractor i finally actually need an actual observatory built into the house so i'm working on working on building an actual observatory onto the south side of the house it's just the best skies for my location is southern viewing and this radio telescope is going to be a part of that so that hopefully i can combine some some optical and radio once I get a little bit more work done on uh, figuring out how to combine that imagery, but I know what you're about to say, and I hopefully didn't drop any spoilers. Not yet, not yet. You didn't. You were you were very careful and did not. Anyway, uh, Andy and I were talking before, and we we're looking at this. So this gives you a very uh, a nice linear view of what happens over a period of time, and um, and and looking at that, it occurred to us that well. You know, television works sort of like that. It changes the intensity of the illumination of each, we'll call it a pixel, even though in old analog televisions it wasn't a pixel, it was just a spot on the screen. Uh, it changes the intensity based on the voltage level. Wouldn't it be interesting if... Well, then I thought back to another thing that a lot of ham guys do for fun. Um... Which is well, two things really. One is called slow scan TV, in which you send you can send pictures to somebody else across the world on the other side of the planet. And um, since it's it, this is done in in the HF bands, it's not a lot of bandwidth. It's below thirty megahertz. You can't really, you know, like on the internet where you can send a picture in an eighth of a second. You had to send it line by line, much like televisions do. And there's freeware that does that for sending and receiving of slow scan TV. Also, there's another thing called WeFax, which is weather facts that's transmitted by NOAA. And you can receive those with a very simple circuit plugged into your computer sound card. So it occurred to us, well, what if we take this linear uh, reading and with an appropriate mount like you'd use on a telescope, again, it would have to be computer driven, if we were to scan the sky in, oh, I don't know, the same number of lines you would expect to get receiving an image in, in, in any of this, uh, and either the slow scan TV or uh, WeFax software, we could make, instead of just a line showing things that, you know, happened over time, we could generate an image that we could then compare with an optical image of the sky and overlay them and have a pretty good indication of a patch of sky, what objects are emitting what levels of uh, RF energy that we'd be detecting. Now. Oh, yeah, this is where stuff <laughs> starts getting real fun. <laughs> yeah. This is, I'm telling you, just building the first thing is pretty damn cool. But. Oh, yeah. You, but you, you guys know Andy, Andy and I are not happy with, with that. So <laughs> we, were ta we were talking about this, and that is uncharted territory. Once we've constructed this, and it works, and we have a good time, you know, with it as is, uh, then phase two will be enhancing it so that, uh, it, you know, when, when you watch a, a PBS special on radio telescopes, they don't just show you a, a spreadsheet with times and times and signal strengths and then show you a graph like this. They show you a picture, and we, we saw one in that first video. Uh, they show you a picture of a patch of sky and and, and what's going on. So that, uh, this will be taking a very simple project and I might as well be honest and complicating it <laughs> to, the, to, the, to, the, 
but still, well, it's and um, and most of that it'll be, and most of that will be the mount that that is able to be attached to the computer, so that it can do the scans at the speed, and a little bit of software changes. Fortunately, it's open source stuff, so if we can do the tweaking and all that, it's, it's oh, how open source works is as long as you credit the. Uh, uh, the you know the original uh, software with links and all that sort of stuff, and you don't try to claim it's all your own. Uh, you're good with it. Um, you know, as we progress, we do get this this to work. That means everybody has it. And um, absolutely. And then amateur radio astronomy comes into regular households all across the globe. And now we start getting the interferometry work that really gets into some high resolution detailed imaging. Oh, uh, mm. yeah. Anyway, should it, so that's uh, that's the overview of the entire project. Phase one. Anyone's interested in building along with us, I mean, uh, you know, contact us on Discord or whatever, and um, that's 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 going to be a breeze. You can end up with something fairly impressive. Um, that honestly, how, how many people can say they have a radio telescope? <laughs> so, you know. I'm Unless you work for SETI or you happen to be in Panama or, yeah, not many. Indeed. Indeed. So that's, uh... And especially in amateur, you know, a lot, a lot of people can sit down and say that they've made an amateur telescope. I'm one of them and there's thousands of us all over the place. Mm. Amateur radio telescope? Mm. Not as yeah, you're right. That does make you kind of you will be kind of unique if you uh, complete the project and and uh, and show some results. That that'll be a unique thing. So. Absolutely, and if <laughs> if you're proud of your nerddom, this will be some of the highest nerddom bragging rights you ever get. <laughs> uh, absolutely, other, uh, other nerds will be buying you beers left and right. When they and just this. imagine how easy it would be to wind up being part of NASA's civilian scientist population if you have your own radio telescope. <laughs> Indeed. And, uh, oh, geez, think about that. Think about some uh, unusual solar activity. If you ha just happened to be the first one to notice it, that would be uh, that would be intriguing. Oh, absolutely. And maybe you're in a position where you're able to witness a dip in intensity due to a transit of Venus, but you don't actually get any observable time for the transit of Venus. That, I wonder, mm. I, I wonder if we have the, the re, I wonder if when we finish this, if we're going to have the resolution, you know, to, to, to be able to detect that. That would be, the, that's, I mean, that's that is a, that is a decent amount of, it would it would be difficult. I'll say that much, but indeed, I think it's absolutely possible. Yeah, and uh, that actually, you know, that that would be better suited for the project as it is, as is described exactly the, as just a graph. Because the yeah, the graph over time, because of, uh, the uh, the one with the imagery will actually for for the kind of science one can do in one's own home, the one with the with the patch of sky image is much less useful. But, oh yeah, uh, that'd be. It would be almost useless, realistically, but a basic graph is the one that you still have up on the screen if you hit, you know, let's say 2803 and had a spike that dipped down and suddenly can, you know, continued onward. Indeed. Hmm. Yeah, still, still, phase two does have the coolness factor that we can do an overlay of here's the visible oh, spectrum yeah. and here's the, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very excited about this, this, this project both phases and absolutely I, generally i don't get excited about anything so this is <laughs> it's gonna be pretty cool i hope anybody that's interested will contact us via it doesn't have to be through discord that's just where we're all together most of the time um anybody that wants to do a build along and and uh you know we'll all send little hints to each other as to watch out for this or you know here's a shortcut you can take um you know it should be a fun thing Absolutely. And, and I always look forward to the interaction. The more people that get involved with uh, doing science, the greater chance we have that science will not uh, vanish from this this nation. <laughs> right? <laughs> I, it's getting harder to find, It's getting, but it hasn't vanished. It's just, you got to look around a bit to find it. Anyway. You do. That, that's, 
that's the uh, that's the thing. That's the project that I that I was talking about, and um, I am I am glad I was just looking through old the uh, old uh, uh, hand magazines online. I don't have these magazines. Uh, that would be a cool thing to have, but um, and this one caught my eye, and I figured that's that's something that yeah I need that. So anyway. Right. <laughs> I think, what do you think, Andy? You think I dragged that out long enough? Probably could have been said in about eight minutes, huh? Uh, no, I think if it was said in eight minutes, that's exactly when you would get into, I saw a diagram, I heard some words, this sounds confusing, I don't want anything to do with it, I'll wait and see. <laughs> okay. Some things need a decent explanation as to what's actually taking place, how it is that it's even come into, and we didn't get into a whole lot of the history of it necessarily, mm -hmm. but this is how these things are used, and guess what? You can do it too. Indeed. Indeed. So, it's, it's, it's not yeah, it, I'm going to say the same thing that Sistrike said. Anyone that's interested in joining in on this project and doing the build along, this is going to be a tremendous amount of fun, and I absolutely encourage you to contact us however it is that you're able to. This is going to be a really fun project over the next indeterminate amount of time as of yet. Indeed. You think it's going to evolve into one of those never-ending things where we keep thinking of new new ways to modify and, uh, <laughs> and get different functionality? Well, that is, uh, I mean, that, that's kind of part of science as a whole. Agreed. So, I I would hope that that's what it would eventually turn into is a continuing project that lasts a significant, maybe not a significant amount of time, but more than just maybe phase one and phase two. Perhaps phase one leads to phase one point one and one point two, and phase two leads to phase two and two point five, and phase three that we don't even know what is yet. I would agree. I would definitely agree. And uh, hopefully the the entire length of the uh, of the project will uh, last long enough, so everyone will learn something new. I I, I know I'm going to going through this project, so hopefully long enough oh, yeah. so folks can learn something new, but not so long that they get bored with it. <laughs> so absolutely, it, sure. Sometimes you want a you want a long project, but you also want results. Yeah, yeah. Results are cool. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, uh oh. Uh oh, Bo, Bo wants a future. Uh, he's he's uh, interested in an additional ham project. He wants to, and, uh, <laughs> and EME kits. <laughs> that's where uh, that's where hams. There, there was there, there's been a lot of experimentation through history in the in the ham community, and um, what, what he's talking about is uh, Earth Moon, EME is Earth Moon Earth. That's where hams bounce to communicate with another ham. They'll bounce a signal off the moon and back. Uh, the moon is not really a bad uh, uh, RF reflector, it seems. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that uh, well, that's that's a possibility. Unfortunately, that's going to cost some coin. Thanks, Bo. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. That's all right. Now, well, who needs to go to Disney again? Well, anyway, and mm -hmm. since Stephen wasn't able to join us, but has been able to get a few a few messages through in the chat. There's a very good chance that we will be making a how-to throughout the entire process, Stephen. So you you can probably count on that being a being part of this entire experiment. Oh, yeah, I would say uh, we all, anyone who's interested, we all go through, we build, we you know swap tips of uh, improvements and gotchas you got to watch out for, and then you know at the end we'll clip that up and and make a nice uh, make a nice how-to. So that's that's a that's a good idea. Absolutely. All right. <coughs> Let's see. Now that that Once. thus endeth the uh, description of the new project that uh, that uh, we shall all start. And like I said, and then Andy said, and I said, please contact us if you're interested in uh, in building your own, and we'll kind of teamwork this one. Absolutely. All right. Um. That's it. That's it for the. That's it for the. Uh, for the radio astronomy segment. Yeah, I think that pretty much covers this project. Mm. Oh, uh, was there anything else that you wanted to share, Sai? 
Oh, I got one thing, but first let's address a question. Uh, Zombie Wolf wants to know, um, are there legal restrictions on what you can intercept from satellites? No. Um, the um, And actually, there's, as far as I know, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act doesn't prohibit you from... Uh, anything unencrypted is fair game. Uh... And not, I think there's, you know, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to pull up that document again. There's something about anything is fair game if you're not sharing it, I believe. Anyway, uh, about the do I, would I just happen to have something else? <laughs> you know, as luck would have it, Andy, I do. Oh, alrighty. <laughs> and uh, here's here, here's a name you, you guys may have heard before, uh, Tesla. <laughs> Anyway, what I wanted to uh, what I wanted to bring up today is I'm, I'm sure you've uh, all seen the wacky claims that uh, um, Nikola Tesla uh, was inventing free energy devices. This is because of a uh, mixing together of two quotes that should never have been in anywhere near each other, although each truthful independently put together they were not. Um, he did, there, there was no there's, there was no free energy or over unity gain nothing that everybody knows that that's just silly. He wanted Indeed. to he wanted to distribute power for free so that it didn't all have to be you know pushed out over copper. Um, and you know at the time it seemed like a good idea uh, to him anyway um, to to the people that had you know. The the the, the um, capitalists who had uh, uh, copper mines <laughs> were not really pleased with that idea. But uh, oh yeah, and that, that by the way, the term capitalist is not is not don't take that as an insulting term. That's what they were. They were capitalists. They owned and controlled the capital, the means of production. Anyway, they were they were not incredibly excited about the idea of uh, sending power via other means for free. Um, but to, to Nikola, Nikola Tesla, it seemed like a great idea. Um, so it, it, there, there was never any intent to, uh, to, to create a free energy device. That's, that's basically silly. Anyway, as it turns out, it wouldn't be such a hot idea anyway, because, uh, basically anywhere you were distributing that much power, you were doing it through, once again, we're talking about radio frequency. That's, how'd you like to live in an RF field that strong? However, his methods <laughs> his, his methods did work, and um, what uh, we commonly refer to as a Tesla coil today, and is mainly used for making impressive looking sparks that that you know can be anywhere from a, a couple of mil millimeters to ten feet long. Uh, that was not the original intent. That's that's the flash that that catches people's attention. Um, it was meant to transfer energy from one point to another. And uh, you know, it's, it's looked at now, looking back, it's a very simple concept, and it's very easy to reproduce. And um, just to demonstrate that it's very easy to reproduce, I did so. Um, you don't say. You found something scientifically based, and you were able to build it, test it, and reproduce results? Something like, yeah, 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 something of that, almost exactly that, yes. Uh, wow, so, that sounds awesome! Yeah, and I, I try. Can I get involved in this <laughs> sciencey <laughs> thing? Sure. Anyway, so I, of course, I. Sorry, uh, I had to. I had the, uh, I had the, uh, the, the Tower of Death, which you may have, uh, you, you all may have seen in previous episodes, and a second smaller coil, one to be the power transmitter and one the receiver. And then, just because I threw this together quick, for uh, this was actually done earlier today. Um, just for just for this show, so I'd be able to demonstrate it. Um, it's uh, it's just a volt a voltmeter attached to the receiving one. So let's let's take a quick look and see how that looks. There we go. This is on one of the porches. Where is it? Here's the video. All right, everybody remembers the Tower of Death. There it is. Anyway, so I, I moved this little this little fella outside and brought its little brother with it. Jeez, 
this? How much of this did I include? Here we go. There's a Tower of Death next to his little brother attached to a bolt. Alright. They are... Let's see, we should... Uh, I believe I have a shot of the bolt meter at... Oh, there it is at zero! Oh, look, we are registering voltage. Now, the actual received voltage is AC, and it's around 60 volts at that distance. The $6 Walmart voltmeter, however, is very upset with being in an RF field like that, <laughs> and, is, and is not very happy with the extremely high-frequency ACs being fed. <laughs> I had uh, originally attached... I have a, a oscilloscope that attaches to the computer, and the, the computer is the display for it. It works pretty well. And the device, the, the uh, USB oscilloscope, is very well shielded. Unfortunately, the laptop is not. So that didn't go so well. And I'll be laptop shopping sometime this evening. Uh, <laughs> so, in, in order to show you guys some results, the only thing I could do is grab the bolt meter and throw it on there and demonstrate that wireless power transfer does work. Oh, and since I had the thing set up anyway, it, nobody would want to go home without seeing at least some sparks. So here's here's what they look like in the daylight. Um, so that's... Nice. <laughs> that's what we got. So... Wow. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and, and, and Stephen likes the Tower of Death. <laughs> yes, yeah, the the voltmeter is not, it was definitely not enjoying that. But Yeah, uh, it, it sure didn't appear to be. And, and, and Bo, you're right. And there's a, there's a, there's a very serious ham operator, uh, four houses down, who's got, uh, Oh, Bo, you would you would be impressed with his beam antenna. It's uh, like a five element Yagi, and the um, each of the elements is a hollow tube, and there's a thing like a tape measure inside of each that changes length, so it tunes itself. The antenna tunes itself to resonance. How's that for fun? Anyway, um, yeah, maybe if I want to put off Disney for eight or ten years, I'll buy one of those. Anyway. <laughs> Oh, oh, look. Nice. So, oh, Andy, this is I think this is a question for both of us. Steven says Sarah wants to know if there have been any new fires. Any over by you, Andy? I have not had a chance to start any fires lately. I well, I'm hopefully finally done getting the garden in this year, so I will be back to work on uh back to work on my coil and building the new MMC that hopefully won't explode and start the lawn on fire, but if it does, I'll make sure to videotape that fire as it happens. Of course, because one, th one thing we've learned through doing these Sunday science shows is everybody <laughs> likes fire and everybody likes Zap Zap. <laughs> so, Indeed. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's that, that's all I have for you, Chief. That's, uh, <laughs> well, that's, well, about, that's about all I have with... Hopefully work will slow up sometime soon. I've had the new engineer in with me for a couple of weeks now, so things are starting to get a little bit more tame and a little bit more manageable. So hopefully I'll be back at work at some of these home projects as opposed to being at work for 11 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And then we'll be back to lighting the lawn on fire and such. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I did that, yeah that uh, that whole spectroscopy thing interested me greatly that was that was pretty cool all righty uh, yeah let's see what is this all right anything you'd like to address sir um no I think that's about all that I have for for this week and I say we get some radio telescopes going <laughs> sounds like a damn good idea all right. Everybody, the link to the original PDF, like I mentioned, is in the description. Uh, yeah, it's not mine. I didn't write it. That's that's from QSD Magazine. They always have interesting little projects in there. Um, or if you just want to wait and do the build along with with us, that's cool too. And uh, like we said, 
contact contact us by uh, by any means uh, at your disposal, and uh, and uh, and we'll get started next next week. Will be the beginning of phase one. How exciting! <laughs> Sounds like a plan. All right. Well, <laughs> and yes, Chris, I was able to uh, discharge my. MMC before any of the animals got to it. They have a tendency to stay inside when I play with stupid stuff that might hurt them. <laughs> oh, speaking of the MMC, I, 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 I'm actually rather surprised. I mean, you saw the thing. Did you notice those? I don't know if in the image you, you could see it clearly enough, Andy. Those uh, capacitors that we bought, the high voltage capacitors that were rated for. Yeah, I noticed those yeah. on the left hand side underneath by your spark gap. Yeah, there's none in series. There, um, there's five of them in parallel to up the, uh, uh, you know, get, give it a few more picofarads there. But uh, hmm. so the theoretically the maximum rating across that, we'll call it an array, but it's not really, is uh, ten thousand volts. The feed voltage for that is 22,000, so I'm actually rather surprised that none of them have exploded. I am as well. I... <laughs> hmm. You know, well, well, maybe I, I had one of those Monday morning or Friday afternoon capacitors in mind. It happens. Could be. Well, you know, the, the other thing I did to, to control the voltage that actually is allowed to build up on them, I did decrease the spark gap to uh, uh, much less than when we first started, we were originally thinking, oh, larger spark gap, that means it'll build up more voltage. Yes, mm -hmm. builds up too much voltage, exploding capacitor. Maybe the yeah, smaller spark gap. that could also be a possibility. Indeed. I think I still have a couple of the old ones left. I might, I might hit the soldering iron tonight and, mm. eh, what the heck. Indeed. All right. Well, What's the worst that could happen? I'd let the smoke out and start something on fire again. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, looks like looks like Bo wants me to increase the spark gap again. All right. <laughs> fine. Capacitors are not cheap. That's all I'm saying. No, they're not. <laughs> all right. Well, I had fun today, Andy. How about you? Oh, absolutely. I always do. And right. hopefully, everybody watching has as much fun as we are. That would be ideal. Indeed. Yeah. I got nothing for other chief. How about you? Uh, no, I think that wraps it up for today. Okay. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Glad yeah. to see you again. Have a great week, everybody. See you all next time. And here we go. Mm -hmm.